Okay, so now we're in section 4.1. Section 4.1, which is called antiderivatives. Okay. Section 4.1, antiderivatives. <coughs> okay. So then we have the first remark. So then, if big F of x, if big F of x is a function such that the derivative of big F of x is little f of x, then we have a following new piece of terminology. Then it is said that big F of x is an antiderivative of little f of x. Right, so then now this is, we're pronouncing, it's like we're taking the sentence that we've usually been saying and we're going to pronounce it in the opposite order. Right, so then previously the question was, okay, how about if I give you the function x squared? What's the derivative of x squared? 2x. Okay, so you can say the derivative of x squared is 2x. That's what we've been saying up to now. Now what we're saying is that 2x is an antiderivative of x squared. Uh, excuse me, the other way. x squared is an antiderivative of 2x. So then now let's compare these two things linguistically with that example. So then, <coughs> right, the derivative of x squared is 2x. Okay, so then from this, from this statement, uh, from this mathematical statement, there are two statements in English. Here's statement number one. The derivative, right, and I'm going to be more specific, the derivative of x squared is 2x. Okay, so that's the way we've been pronouncing this situation up until now. Okay, now, another way to say this now is an antiderivative of 2x is x squared. So now linguistically, right, there's some important things here. Right, so then we have these two pieces of English syntax and they both belong to the same category of syntax. What is What part of speech are the and an? Articles, right? They're the article. There's two articles. Okay, one of them is definite and one of them is indefinite. Which is definite and which is indefinite? The is definite. Okay, so then <coughs> the indicates uniqueness. The derivative of x squared is 2x. There is no other. Okay, but now linguistically we have to say an antiderivative of 2x is x squared. And what this is saying is this is opening the possibility that, well, there might be other antiderivatives. Right? There might be other antiderivatives. So then now, what I want you to see is this. So here is a perfectly legitimate statement. This is correct. Now I want you to do this. Okay, we're going to play Jeopardy, right? Have you ever watched the show Jeopardy where they give you the answer and you're supposed to provide them with the correct question? Okay, so then now. The answer is the derivative of whatever is 2x. And I want you to give me something that I can put in there that's not the one I already gave you. I already gave you x squared, so someone give me something else. x squared plus what? Plus 1, okay. So can you see that, oh, okay, all right. Uh, I put x squared plus 1 in there. So then what was... What was special about the plus one? How come that it still worked? Ah, because it's a constant. So then can you see that x squared plus c, for any constant whatsoever, its derivative is 2x. Its derivative is 2x. So then now, 
we're in this situation that I want you to see is that, okay, if I give you a function, there is only one derivative. There's only one. If I give you another function, there are infinitely many antiderivatives. Okay, at least this many, right? So then I can choose for any constant I like. And because there's infinitely many different constants to choose from, there's infinitely many antiderivatives of a particular function. Okay, so does everybody see the situation we're in? So then <clears throat> we have been going in this class, calculus from the differential point of view, as far as computation is concerned, we have been doing this. We've been going this direction for the whole semester. Okay, now we are going to start going in the other direction. And we will use various things that we have, you know, you will see all of the various things that we have done up until now. Okay, but they will be acting in reverse. And the truth of the matter is, is that the, rever the reversal of the procedures that we've done is simply more complicated. It's more complicated. And in some cases, it's not going to be possible. Sort of like, it's pretty easy to pour water into a glass but it's really pretty difficult to get that water to shoot back up out of the glass into the pitcher, right? <laughs> Reversing the process is complicated. Okay, so does everybody sort of see what it is that we're going to be doing now? We're doing the reverse procedures of everything that we've done up until now. Okay, and that is why linguistically the choice for the word is, an is antiderivative, because we've been doing things from the derivative point of view, and now we're going to do things from the antiderivative point of view. <clears throat> okay, so then now, how about this? You can see that on this example, x squared plus c, its derivative is 2x for any c. Now you might wonder, you know, there's a lot of functions in the universe, right? There's a lot of them. Is there any other sort of strange function that maybe you've just never seen before? Like maybe it has some strange name, you know, log. Maybe you've never seen logs. There's such a thing called logs that we haven't talked about. Maybe there's other strange functions that scientists haven't even considered yet. Is it possible that the derivative of one of them is 2x? Hmm. What, what can have a derivative of 2x? Okay, so then apparently x squared plus c can have a derivative of 2x for any c, but can anything else in the universe have that derivative? And the answer is no. No, nothing else can have that derivative. Okay, so then now we need to demonstrate that. Specifically, <coughs> specifically this. <coughs> Suppose we are given little f of x and that big F of x and big G of x are both antiderivatives of little f of x on <coughs> an interval i. Okay, so we're given some function. And now what we're saying is that, okay, we have two different antiderivatives. There's two different ones. And what we want to show is that then f of x is equal to, big F of x is equal to big G of x plus a constant. And what this is saying is that, as a consequence, the thing that you need to take away from this is the difference between any two antiderivatives Of, of little f is constant. Right, that's the takeaway message. <coughs> okay, so then let's show, let's show that this is true. <coughs> so the way it is shown is as follows. So then, we'll show it. According to the fact that big F and big G are, uh, are both antiderivatives of little f, we know that the derivative of big F is what? 
little f, right? Because that is that is the mathematical sentence which is corresponding to the Eng English sentence that big F is an antiderivative of little f. Okay, what is another mathematical sentence that looks almost just like this that we know? The derivative of what? Big G is what? Little f, right? So then they're both antiderivatives. So the derivative of each one of them is little f. Okay, now we're going to uh, define big H of x is equal to <coughs> big F of x minus big G of x. Okay, so then now <coughs> this, is, this is defined on the interval i because big F and big G are both defined on I, so H, the difference, is defined on I. Now we can compute the derivative of big H. The derivative of big H is the derivative of big F minus big G. But the derivative is, you know, has the, the difference rule, the difference rule, so then this is the derivative of big F minus the derivative of big G. But we know what the derivative of big F is. The derivative of big F is what? Little f. And what's the derivative of big G? Little f. And little f minus little f, well that's zero. So then what we have just shown is the, the primary piece of the argument, and that is that the derivative of big H is zero. Right? The derivative of big H is zero. So what does that mean? What does that mean? You have a function, and its derivative is zero everywhere on an interval. Its derivative is zero everywhere on an interval. It means that that function had to be constant because if you will recall, if you will recall, the fact that f of little f is defined on i means it's defined everywhere, and that f and the fact that big F and big G are antiderivatives of little f means that they are differentiable everywhere. So then we have a function which is differentiable on an interval. We have big F is differentiable on an interval, big G is differentiable on an interval, and H, the difference between those things, is therefore differentiable on an interval. So we have a function which is differentiable on an interval, and its derivative is zero on that interval. So now you go back to our discussions about the mean value theorem, and you should remember that we went over something called the, the constant lemma. Right? First we said that, okay, the derivative of a constant is zero. And then we said, but what if I give you a function and its derivative is zero everywhere on an interval? Then that function was necessarily a, a constant, right? So then the zero lemma is telling us, so therefore, by the zero lemma, or the constant lemma, I can't remember what I called it. H of x is equal to c for some constant. So then, <coughs> so then what that's saying is that big F of x minus big G of x is a constant, which is saying that big F is big G plus a constant. So that's good, because what's that, what that is telling us is that, okay, so we first had the realization that, okay, there are infinitely many antiderivatives of a function, right? Because I gave you the example of x squared, the derivative of x squared is 2x, and the derivative of x squared plus any constant is also 2x. So there's infinitely many things who have derivative x squared. But all of them look like x squared plus, t uh, x squared plus c. There are no others. There are no others. Okay, so then there's a lot of them, but all of them differ by a constant. So any question about this situation? Any question about this situation? 
Okay, <clears throat> good. So then, so then, we need to do a couple things. So what do we got going on here? So first we need to get the notation. Now historically speaking, the derivative, uh, the, the di differential calculus and this new calculus that we're talking about were developed separately and it was not even clear <laughs> the, the, the you know, mathematicians and scientists and whatever that were figuring this out, they didn't even realize that they are just reverse procedures of each other. Right? So then these two things, they went on and sort of simultaneously in history and then someone came by and said, oh, these are just, we're doing the same thing but in reverse. You know, people eventually got it figured out. So then the notation that we will use here is significantly different and you're just going to have to become accustomed to it. So then this this is the notation, the, diff, uh, the derivative notation. The derivative of big F is little f. So the derivative of big F is little f. And an antiderivative of little f is big F. So then this is the notation you already know. And here is the new notation we will begin to use. So then first off, this symbol, this symbol is literally a tall and skinny S. Okay, but please don't write it like an S. Don't write something like this. That looks absurd. Okay, it's a tall and skinny S. Okay, so then, like so. So these two statements right here, mathematical sentences, they have the same meaning in this class. Okay, and this is pronounced, this is pronounced, uh, the antiderivative of little f of x is big F of x plus c. Plus c. So then now, there's a little bit, just a slight bit of linguistic abuse going on here because what, what, what slight lingu linguistic abuse is happening here? Right, so then I'm using the definite article now. Now, is there just one antiderivative? No, there are infinitely many antiderivatives, but this is the standard linguistic abuse that's used in all math books, and the indefiniteness of it is right here, plus C. All right, so then, does everybody see what's going on here? <clears throat> okay, good. So then, now... For every derivative rule, there is a corresponding antiderivative unrule. Okay. That is to say, let's see just for an example before we do it. How about I give you an, uh, this function right here? The derivative, I want you to compute the derivative of, say, 5x squared plus 2x uh, plus 3 to the 4. So then how would you compute this derivative? With the, with the power rule and the chain rule combined, right? Okay, so you'd have to use the power rule first. So this would be like 4, 5x squared plus 2x plus 3 to the 3 multiplied by the derivative of the inside, which is 10x plus 2. Okay, so then now, imagine that you can't see this line at all. Imagine it is invisible to you. And now, I have a question for you. Please compute the following. Please compute the following. What goes on, th what goes on this side? <laughs> and the answer is, oh, I don't know. It's kind of complicated now, right? I don't know exactly what's going to go here, but but now if you just have a glance, if you just glance back at this top line, can, you should be able to tell me what the answer is. What is the answer? It is this thing, 5x squared plus 2x plus 3 to the 4, but the answer is not correct currently. 
what is not correct about my response plus C, right? Now it's correct. Okay, so then the goal of the next several lectures is going to get you to be able to perform this operation, right? The, the question, as I stated, it was trivial, right? I said, here's a function, compute its derivative. Now compute the antiderivative of your response. And it's just to write, it just means write the other thing. Okay, so then now, mm, how, about, how about this? Let's ease into it. How about, please compute the antiderivative of uh, 3x squared dx. So what you should be doing here is you should be thinking, do I know anything whose derivative is 3x squared? x to the 3, right? Right, x to the 3. And then now I say plus c plus c. But that's not a very like, you know, that seems like sort of a backwards way to think about it, right? Try and think of, okay, where can I start and then apply this thing and then land where I want. So then generally speaking, how do you go from x, from x cubed to 3x squared? What's the name of that derivative rule? The, the power rule, right? The power rule. So then what we need is we need a mechanism to do the power rule in reverse. And that's what we really need. So then Let's uh, write that down. So then the power rule So for derivatives For derivatives the derivative of x to the n Right we demonstrated this weeks ago the derivative is n x to the n minus 1 Derivative is n x to the n minus 1 so then this is a perfectly legitimate thing, so now I'm going to write something that is equally true, but not actually very helpful. The antiderivative of nx to the n minus 1 dx is therefore what? x to the n plus c. And this is a perfectly legitimate statement. It's just not very useful. What we need, what we need is something that looks like this, the antiderivative of x to the n dx antiderivative of x to the n dx. So now, <clears throat> we're going to figure it out like this. So then when you're computing a derivative, you subtract 1 from the exponent. So when you're doing the opposite procedure, you won't subtract 1, you will add 1. Okay, so that's going to be part of it. Okay, so then now, when you're computing a derivative, you multiply by the old exponent, right? The new exponent is n minus 1, so the old exponent is n. So you multiply by the old exponent. So if you're, going to do, if you're going to do this procedure in reverse, you won't multiply by the old exponent. You will divide by the new exponent. Okay, so then divided by n plus 1. And then how do I finish out the statement? Plus c. So this one that I'm boxing in red, this is a rule that you must learn to love. <laughs> this is called the power rule for antiderivatives. Okay, so then let's verify that this is in fact the case. So then specifically, The way to, you know, the way that we have defined antiderivatives to show that this statement that I boxed in red is a fact, the way we need to do it is we need to differentiate the right hand side and verify that we obtain the integrand on the left hand side. Specifically, we need to differentiate this x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Okay, so then now, division by n plus 1, that is a constant multiplier that I can factor out and say, well, that's 1 over n plus 1 multiplied by the derivative of x to the n plus 1, right? Because that's just a constant, the n thing is. So this is 1 over n plus 1 multiplied by, now I use the power rule, I will get n plus 1 multiplied by x to the n plus 1 minus 1 according to the power rule. So then now you can see the n plus 1 uh, multiply and divide, it cancels. 
it cancels. And n plus 1 minus 1 is n, so this is x to the n. Okay, so then this is a legitimate formula, except not entirely, right? Because there's, a, there's exactly one case in the universe where this is not a legitimate formula. When might this formula not actually prevail? What could go wrong here? What could go wrong? n could be negative 1. What if n was negative 1? Could you divide by negative 1 plus 1? No, negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So you couldn't divide by 0. Ah, so then when is this true? This is true for anything and, and in any case when n is not equal to negative 1. For today, we're just going to omit consideration of the case when n is negative 1, and we're going to say that we'll handle it at a later time. Okay, but this, what I've said on this page, works for any n that is not negative 1. So any question about it? That being the case, that being the case, let's do a quick example. So for example, please compute for me the antiderivative of x to the 7. This is not a trick question at all. Okay, so then after that, please compute the antiderivative of the square root of x. And then after that, please compute the antiderivative of 1 over x cubed. And that's probably enough for the moment. <coughs> So what's this antiderivative? Yep, x to the 8 over 8 plus a constant. Okay, so then now, um, well, what about this? Ah, we should rewrite it. We should say that this is the antiderivative of x to the 1 half, dx. So then now we're using the power rule with n is what? 1 half. So this is in, uh, x to the 1 half plus 1 divided by 1 half plus 1 plus some constant. <coughs> okay, so then now x to the 1 half plus 1, that's 3 halves. So that's x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves plus a constant. So then now, at this point, there is almost certainly a student there saying that should I or do I have to say that that's multiplication by two-thirds instead of division by three-halves? And my response to you is, I don't care. If that's what you feel like you must do, then please do that. I realize that many of you have been psychologically conditioned into that state. Yes? The, the TAs won't care either. <coughs> They'll say yes? Well, then do what they say because they may grade you. <laughs> they will grade you. So then, you know, the instructions, the standing orders that I give to the graders is that simplification is not necessary unless explicitly requested. Okay? So then now, how about this one? How about this one? So let me write something that is incorrect, but I suspect at least one of you or two of you in the crowd have done. 1 over x to the 4 over 4 plus a constant. This is emphatically incorrect. Okay, so if you have done this, then take note. <laughs> don't, don't admit to it. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Just take note that this certainly is not correct. Okay, so then instead we need to rewrite this. Okay, how shall we rewrite this? Yes, the antiderivative of x to the negative 3 dx Okay, so then now it will be x to the negative 3 plus 1 over negative 3, negative 3 plus 1 plus a constant. So then this is uh, x to the negative 2 divided by negative 2 plus a constant. Okay, so any question about this one? Any question? <coughs> okay, so then now, now let's do one more. 
the antiderivative of x squared dx okay, and this is not a trick question at all okay so then this is x to the 3 over 3 and then this is the answer right ah plus c right plus c and so this is the this is the opener into into a joke so then i want to tell you a joke now <coughs> So then, now, physicists, what can I say? As a mathematician, physicists just think that they're the most clever people on the planet. Okay, so then, so then two physicists go to a, a bar restaurant, okay? And the one physicist is saying to the other physicist, you know, we're physicists, we're the smartest people that, that exist. The rest of the people are sheep, right? All these people in this restaurant, they're all sheep. They don't know anything. And then the other physicist says, you know, I, I don't really agree with that. I think that maybe people are smarter than you, than you give them credit for. And, he's, and the first one says, no, 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 they just don't know anything. And so eventually he gets up to go to the bathroom, the one saying that nobody knows anything. And the other one calls the waitress over and says, waitress, waitress, come here. Okay, my friend's in the bathroom right now. Now I'm going to ask you a question when he comes back. You're not going to have any idea what I'm talking about. That's fine. It doesn't matter. But when I ask you this question, I want you to say x cubed over 3. Can you repeat that for me? And she says, x cubed over 3. And he says, OK, great. OK, great. OK, great. So then I'll call you when he comes back. So he comes back, and he says to the waitress, waitress, I, I have, a, I have a, a bet with my friend. Could you tell me what the antiderivative of x squared dx is? And she says, um, uh, x cubed over 3. And he turns to his friend and says, see, I told you. And then she says, plus C, you jerk. <laughs> plus C. You know, he, he forgot the plus C. He's so clever. OK. <clears throat> no, I, 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 like, I know lots of physicists, and I think they're really smart and everything. I don't have anything against them. OK, but, but no, no, that if you don't write the plus C, you will be incorrect and graded as incorrect. Okay, because if you don't write the plus C, then this indicates that you don't understand the non-uniqueness of antiderivatives. They are not unique. And if you don't write the plus C, then what that intimates to the greater is that you do not understand that. Okay, so any questions about this? So then now, we need to quickly go through several rules. <coughs> okay, so now we're just going to quickly go through several rules that correspond to antiderivatives that have corresponding derivative rules. So then, specifically, how about, uh, how about if I tell you that the antiderivative of little f dx is big F plus a constant. Okay, so then now, how about, how about the antiderivative of k multiplied by f of x dx, where k is a constant, what will happen? The k just stays in front. It's k times big F of x plus a constant. Right? So then this is the constant multiple rule. And it is just like the uh, constant multiple rule for derivatives. Okay, so then this, from a math mathematician's point of view, this says that the antiderivative procedure is homogeneous just like the derivative procedure. It is homogeneous. Okay, so then similarly, okay, so if I tell you another antiderivative, the antiderivative of little g dx is big G plus a constant, then I could ask, well, how about, what is the antiderivative of, of little f plus little g? dx. So what is it in this case? So it will be big F plus big G plus some unknown constant. So then from a, a mathematician would say that the antiderivative procedure is additive. So you have an additive and homogeneous operation, which means it's linear, just like the derivative. Okay, great. So then finally, one that is 
that is a consequence of these already, but one that I wish to just point out because many students uh, don't see it immediately. How about what is the antiderivative of k dx for any k? So how about this? I'll ask a more simple question. Can you think of anything that has an antiderivative, uh, excuse me, a, a derivative of 3? What's something that has a derivative of 3? Three? 3x. Three Okay, and wh how did that work? What was special about 3? Three? 3 was a constant. So, can you think of anything that has a derivative of k? kx, right? kx, and then plus any constant. Okay, so then, <coughs> any question about this? Any question about this? And the last one that many students have difficulty seeing is, how about, what about the antiderivative of 0 dx? A constant, right? A constant. Okay, so then now that we have these, now that we have these, we have broadened our horizons significantly, I can ask you to compute this antiderivative. How about the antiderivative of, say, 5x cubed dx? That's just a, 5 is just a multiplier, so it's 5 multiplied by x to the 4 over 4 plus a constant. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so then how about compute the antiderivative of x squared plus x to the, uh, I don't know, 3. That'd be great. So then, so then what? So x to the 3 over 3, and then what? Plus x to the 4 over 4, and then plus c, good. Okay, so any question about this one? Any question about this one? Okay, how about, <coughs> how about this one? I'm attempt, and I'm telling you now that I am attempting to make you make a mistake. How about the antiderivative of x squared multiplied by x cubed. Okay, so then now I'm going to write the mistake that I suspect two or three of you have made. Okay, so then x to the 3 over 3 multiplied by x to the 4 over 4 plus a constant. No, no, right? So then, what about when you're computing derivatives, right? Derivatives of products. Is it just, you know, we have a whole rule concerning that, right? The product rule, right? The derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Do you suppose the antiderivative will just be like that? Oh, it's a product. Just compute the antiderivative of each term and just call it a day. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. So then... No, instead, the first thing that you need to do is you need to say, ah, well, I will algebraically simplify this into x to the 5 dx, because x to the 2 times x to the 3 is x to the 5, and so this is x to the 6 over 6 plus a constant. Okay, so any question about this one? So now I will try, I will try to trick you again, okay, but now I will probably be not successful, hopefully. How about x to the 7 divided by the antiderivative of x to the 7 divided by uh, x, x to the 2 dx? Okay, so should it be to compute the antiderivative of the numerator and also the antiderivative of the denominator like that? No, no, no. No, you need to perform algebraic simplifications first, so then x to the 7 divided by x to the 2 is x to the 5, and so this one is also x to the 6 over 6 plus a constant. Good. So any question about that one? Okay, how about the antiderivative of, <coughs> how about the antiderivative of this? So then x plus, mm, 
I don't know, x plus the square root of x divided by uh, x to the 3 dx. So what should you do? You need to algebraically change this until you have gotten each piece into rules that you know. So for example, you could say that, well, this is x over x to the 3 plus the square root of x over x to the 3 dx. Okay, so then now I can simplify each of those terms and say that, well, this one is x to the negative 2 plus, so that's x to the 1 half divided by x to the 3 and 1 half minus 6 halves is negative 5 halves, so x to the negative 5 halves dx. And now, each one of these, you know how to compute the antiderivative of each one of them separately, and with the sum rule, you can say that this is x to the negative 1 divided by negative 1 plus x to the negative 3 halves divided by negative 3 halves plus a constant. So any question about this one? Okay. So then how about, how about this one? The antiderivative of 5x squared plus x to the x to the x plus 3x minus x to the x to the x plus 7 dx. <coughs> So, in the previous examples, what would you say my recommendation is on these last three? You need to do what first? You need to simplify the thing first. So, for those of you, I'm aware that many of you have had exposure to calculus before, and you know, it, if I'm talking to you, you have no idea to how to compute, and neither do I. I have no idea how to compute the antiderivative of x to the x to the x. None whatsoever. But can you see that you can simplify this expression a little bit? Right? You have x to the x to the x minus x to the x to the x. Ah, okay, so then that's just 0, right? Okay, so then 5x squared plus 3x mi uh, plus 7. Can you compute the antiderivative of this thing? Yes. Okay, so then this will be 5x to the 3 over 3 plus 3x to the 2 over 2 plus 7x plus a constant. Okay, wonderful. So then the last things I'm going to say are these, is that for every, for every an, uh, derivative rule, you have a corresponding antiderivative unrule. So let's quickly write down the trig rules, and then we can say, have a good weekend. Okay, so then the antiderivative of the sine of x, dx. So the thing you should ask yourself is whose derivative is sine? Not cosine, negative cosine. Negative cosine of x dx. <coughs> okay, so then the antiderivative of cosine of x dx is what? Whose derivative is cosine? Sine. Uh, what is these dx's here? Those don't belong there. This should be plus c, and this should be plus c. Okay, so then, <coughs> now, what's another trig function you know the derivative of? The derivative of, what's another one? Tangent. You know the derivative of tangent is what? Secant squared. So the derivative, the antiderivative of secant of x squared dx is what? Is tangent of x. Okay, so what's another trig function you know the derivative of? Which one? Cosecant? Okay, so we'll write cosecant here, plus c, and then for a reason which will become clear, I'll write a negative here. Okay, so then, what is the derivative of cosecant? Negative cosecant cotangent. So the antiderivative of cosecant cotangent of x dx is negative cosecant. 
Okay, so then now, here are, uh, there's two more. Which ones remain? So we have cosine, sine, tangent, cosecant. So secant and cotangent are the ones that remain. I'll leave it to you to, to write down what they are, but I would like to point something out. I'd like to point something out. I'll write the right-hand sides of the remaining two. There is negative cotangent of x plus c. Something will have that as its right-hand side. And something will have, what's the, the last one? Secant. Something will have secant plus c. So then now, I want you to see a pattern. There are six right-hand sides. Three of them have negatives in front of them. Three of them do not. What is it? that the ones with negatives in front of them have in common. They start with C, right? <laughs> cosecant, cotangent, and cosine. Okay, so this is a pattern that I, that I pointed out to you when we did the derivative point of view, right? The derivatives and the antiderivatives of when you have the co-functions, the co-trig functions, a negative SIGN comes in. Okay? Good. See you on Monday. <coughs>